Now, now I know when I receive a sky and telescope, I open it up from the back and I flip back to the astronomer's workbench. And, and that's the section I read because uh, at heart, I am a telescope enthusiast. I like designing them, I like building them. Uh, and it's so it's with great pleasure that I introduce the columnist and the editor of Sky and Telescopes, Astronomer's Workbench. And he's got a great presentation for us, unusual telescope designs. I'm really looking forward to this and, and I think you'll be very pleased also. So without further ado, I will stop my screen sharing and, and I will let Jerry uh, share his screen and give his presentation. All righty. Uh, well, thank you all, and uh, thanks for the warm welcome. Um, I have been writing that Astronomer's Workbench column for about six years now, and I get submissions, oh gosh, weekly, you know, from people who have built telescopes that they would like to have featured in the magazine. And, uh, you know, unfortunately, I, I can only do 12 a year. Okay, obligatory Zoom cat just went by. Uh, <laughs> so uh, um, I have built up a real selection of scopes that I have written about and scopes I haven't. Uh, and uh, I've seen some odd ones. So I'm going to, uh, let's see, let's go back over to my presentation here. Oh, actually, no, all right. I, I can just hit share screen and choose that. There we go. There we go. And let's see if this works. Okay, you guys see the uh, opening sh screenshot there? Yes. Okay, we're good. Okay, so um, yeah, <laughs> this is this is perhaps a little bit more than I've ever actually seen, but this is the kind of thinking that I uh, that I sometimes see, and I get kind of amused by it. Um, you know, how complicated can we make a telescope, um, or how odd can we make one? And the answer is pretty darn strange. Um, so I'm going to start very briefly by just talking about what actually makes a telescope. Okay, let's see. Why am I not? Okay. Um, oh, okay. There we go. It's not jumping forward with my arrow key, but I can do it this way. All right. So basically a telescope is anything that takes a wide beam of light going inward and puts a narrow beam of light going outward. And when you squeeze the light down like that, you magnify it. Uh, you ma magnify the image and um, you, know, you can see more. All right. So how do we do that? Well, Galileo figured out if you put a, um, a magnifying lens in the front and a reducing lens closer to the eye, you can get that configuration. You get a narrow beam of light coming out. But the problem with that is that you're looking at your objective lens through a reducing lens. So without the eyepiece in, this is the size of your objective. And with the eyepiece in, the objective lens now looks very, very small, even though there's a magnified image in it, um, but you get a very, very small um, image. Uh, it's upright, that's the one, one advantage to it, but that's about the only advantage to it. Um, so uh, Johannes Kepler came up with a better design and it was simply to allow the light beams to cross in front of the eyepiece and use a magnifying lens rather than a reducing lens. Uh, and that way, when you're looking at the objective through the eyepiece, you're looking through a magnifying lens, and that makes the objective look bigger. And so here's kind of a comparison of the two scopes. Uh, you know, the image that you're seeing of the moon is the same size. The Keplerian image is upside down and inverted left to right, but you get so much more space, right? So right away, we can see that there are some good designs, and there are some bad designs. <laughs> and, you know, Galileo's design was was cool for its time, but Kepler very quickly came up with a better one. And uh, so you can see this is a typical Galilean telescope today in that nobody makes them today, right? <laughs> this is a typical Keplerian telescope. Uh, you know, they're everywhere. There's pretty much any little basic refractor telescope is a Keplerian design. Okay, so with that in mind, um, Let's talk about why would you want to do anything different? Why, why not just, why isn't every telescope a Keplerian telescope? Well, some of us like to tinker, um, but there's also 
uh, actual problems with a basic refractor, and that is coma and uh, chromatic aberration. And here I'm showing chromatic aberration where out in the corners of the field, you can see the, the colors don't all come to focus at the same point. And this is typical of any refractor. Um, and what they learned pretty quickly on was the longer you made the focal length, the less of this chromatic aberration you got. And so this is probably the strangest telescope <laughs> ever created. I've got to think it's 140 feet long. And uh, it was only 30 years after the invention of the telescope. Um, and uh, they're already doing crazy stuff like this. Um, and uh, without the intervening uh, architecture, um, Christian Huygens built one where he just had a rope between the eyepiece and the objective and he pulled the rope tight and he could walk around in a circle at the base. And uh, he, I think he could raise and lower the tower. It looks like, yeah, there's a, there's a rope here for raising and lowering the tower. So he, he, could, he had a little bit of altitude adjustment and quite a lot of azimuth adjustment. But stuff like that, you know, it's just really not very practical. So people kept trying to come up with better designs. And uh, James Gregory uh, in 1663 came up with a design that actually is a pretty decent design, a mirror in the back and a mirror in front, a uh, secondary mirror bouncing light back through a hole in the, in the primary mirror. Um, problem was that you needed to use uh, mirrors that were ground very accurately and um, non-spherical. They had to be parabolic. Uh, and so it wasn't until well after Newton came up with a telescope that anybody actually built one of these, um, but they did. And that's what one looks like, Gregorian telescope. Um, problem is the field of view is very narrow and the magnification is very high. Um, so, you know, good for planets and things like that, I suppose. Um, we found one other really cool use for the Gregorian design, Arecibo, the radio telescope is Gregorian. Um, you know, there's a secondary reflector up here. Uh, this can also be used as a primary cage, but there's a, a tertiary or a, uh, a detector down at the bottom of the dish. So they, they use this as a Gregorian design sometimes. And uh, uh, I was really pleased to see that that, that scope uh, was using technology invented in the, the 1660s. Um, but Newton came along in 1668 with the design that uh, pretty much took hold, kind of like Kepler with refractors. This is, this is the Keplerian of reflectors. It's the Newtonian design. Single primary mirror in the back, um, secondary mirror, just a flat angled to reflect light into an eyepiece. And uh, Newton's first attempt at it just tickles me pink because he got the eyepiece hole wrong. And I love that because I do that every time. <laughs> Whenever I'm doing a telescope, I, I get it measured wrong and then I have to redrill the eyepiece hole. And I'm glad to see that Isaac Newton did the same thing. And I'm also really pleased to see that he mounted his telescope on a ball, which is what I do. I, I make what I call a trackball telescope. And you'll see that later in this talk. But it uh, proves to me that this is the most natural way to build a telescope. <laughs> so this is kind of the basic telescope design. and. Uh, it pleases me to see it. And uh, William Herschel used the Newtonian dis design with a seven foot long, uh, six inch aperture telescope. And this is the scope that he used to make a lot of his discoveries with. And you'll notice it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have the usual hardware here for uh, ele elevation. It's got a, 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 a a bracket around the back that, to lift it. And then it's got wheels on the bottom where you just roll it around. That was the altitude and the azimuth adjustment for this scope. Um, and there's little cranks here. This is this fine tuning for altitude. And uh, I suppose one or another of these little cranks, yeah, these are the cranks for uh, course adjustment on altitude. Um, you know, odd looking thing, but it was very functional and he did a lot of astronomy with it. Um, his 40 foot telescope, you know, he wanted to uh, have a better look at these uh, spiral, well, uh, of these fuzzy nebulae. He didn't know that they were spiral until this telescope was built. Um, but one of the things I want to point out, look at where the observer's cage is. You're standing here in front of it and you're looking in the edge. 
So light goes down inside, bounces back up to the eyepiece, no secondary mirror. And uh, we'll talk a little about that more later, but the, the point there is that he was using uh, speculum metal, which had a very low reflectivity, like 70% or so. And so he wanted to eliminate that second mirror. So he made a really long telescope and uh, he tilted the mirror just enough to put the eyepiece at the edge. And uh, that has all sorts of implications that we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, Lord Ross made the 72 inch Leviathan of Parsontown. And uh, you know, he used this a lot. And uh, it, it's a basic Newtonian design. This is where the observer goes and the eyepiece is in the side the way a Newtonian scope is. Um, so it didn't have a tilted mirror or any of that. Uh, it was very limited in azimuth. It had about an hour of uh, azimuth adjustment. Uh, you could raise and lower it in altitude quite a ways, but in azimuth, you could only track for about an hour before you banged into these walls. So, uh, you know, very cool, very large scope for today, but kind of limited. So uh, in the 18, early 1800s, uh, 1824, we came up with equatorial mounts, the German equatorial mount. And that was the standard for years and years and years. Um, and scopes got bigger and bigger and they got more and more unwieldy on these enormous equatorial mounts. Uh, you know, this is a cave Astrola from probably the 1960s or 70s, cast iron, you know, that thing would be a bear to move around. Uh, you know, it, it, this is a huge mount for what nowadays is kind of an average telescope. That looks like maybe a 12 inch. Um, you know, a lot of people carry those in their cars nowadays. And this is how they do it. That John Dobson came up with a design <clears> that was unusual when he introduced it, but it's, it's, it's the standard now. And the reason for that is it's very easy to build and it's very easy to use. You, you've got your rocker box for altitude here. You got your ground board and uh, your azimuth motion just swivels on that. And uh, Dobson said basically he got the inspiration from cannons on uh, the walls of castles in Europe. And, and sure enough, it, it looks and, and behaves kind of like a cannon, <laughs> a yard cannon. So, uh, you know, a common Newtonian telescope today, we call it a Dobsonian because the design is so, um, so good and so common. So what started out as an unusual design in the 70s is now totally normal. It's not unusual at all. In fact, anything that's not a Dobsonian is considered unusual today. So, uh, you know, you'll see a lot of Dobsonians. Uh, we do things like cutting the middle out uh, to save weight and to make it more portable and just using trusses instead of the, the full length tube. Uh, that's uh, very common nowadays, especially in the larger scopes. Um, Here's a, <laughs> this is my double scale uh, astro scan. I built a replica of the astro scan at double scale, but down inside, there's still a you know, primary mirror and a secondary mirror up here, bouncing light off to the side. It's just a Newtonian telescope with an unusual case around it. Uh, and that's all the astro scan ever was. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, I think almost all, um, I don't know, medium unusual telescopes. Basically, the, the unusual part is the housing. The optics are almost always going to be Newtonian. And uh, the problem, of course, with Newtonians is, you know, the mirror doesn't give you chromatic aberration, but they do suffer from coma, whereas the stars out near the edges of the field are smeared out. Uh, even though the parabola brings all of the outcome or the incoming light to a focus at a point, um, it's tends to get smeared out the farther away you are from the, uh, the center. It's much better than a spherical mirror, but it's still not good. So how do we deal with coma? Well, there's the Cassegrain design, which is essentially you make the focal length longer and uh, you use a, a primary mirror down here, parabolic, and then a hyperbolic secondary that stretches the, the uh, cone, the focal cone out to where it looks like a much, much longer focal length. And, you know, remember how they were doing that with refractors in the early 1600s. Uh, well, here we are doing this with reflectors with a little more sophisticated technology by making the secondary mirror act like a very uh, long, or, or, you know, it acts to stretch the light cone out a very long way. 
So, uh, you know, there's that. Uh, the schmidt cassegrain uh, if we put a corrector plate, uh, a clear correct plate in front, then these two mirrors can both be spherical because all the correction is done through the corrector glass. Uh, so that made it a little bit simpler and easier to manufacture and uh, the schmidt cassegrain became uh, a standard. It started out being unusual, became a standard, uh, and we still get a lot of schmidt cassegrains nowadays. Um, Maxitov is another way of doing it in that the corrector is now just a spherical section of glass. The secondary mirror is painted right on the back or just uh, a little, um, vacuum deposited right on the back of the corrector. So you have only two spherical components. You got the spherical primary, spherical secondary on a spherical corrector. And so Maxitas are pretty easy to manufacture and they're even fairly easy to build. I, I bought a lens set for one of these and, and built one myself. Uh, you know, they're, they're tricky to align, but not too bad. So, uh, you know, Maxitas are fairly common nowadays too. Here's one I love is the Mangan mirror. It's basically you take and you just glue it right to the primary. So you've got the, the glass corrector in front of the primary mirror. And one of the cool things about that is you've only got two surfaces that have to be uh, corrected. Uh, and, and they can both be spherical. And the uh, coating can be put on the back of the primary instead of the front. So it's not so fragile. Uh, Mangan mirrors are, are really cool. And uh, it makes me kind of wonder why we don't see more of them. Um, but we do. Uh, the Klevtsov telescope is uh, kind of a um, hybrid that uses a Mangan mirror in the back. And then it uses some uh, spherical surfaces up here in front for uh, correcting. Uh, apparently this isn't sufficient correction all by itself back here in the back. So it uses a couple more, um, but I've never seen a Klevtsov. They apparently never took off. Uh, maybe it's the corrective lenses are too difficult to do, or maybe there's too much light loss or it reintroduces chromatic aberration. I'm not really sure, but I thought that was a kind of an odd, unusual design that uh, uh, mathematically works really well, but I've never actually seen one. But that brings us to the Richie Coutain design, which uh, uses a hyperbolic primary, hyperbolic secondary, uh, which are hard to make. But when you do that, they are almost coma free all the way out to the edge of the field. And uh, with the result that almost all professional instruments now are Richie Coutain designed, like the Keck. Um, and it's using segmented mirrors, but and each segment is part of a parabolic or hyperbolic primary. Um, another very common or very popular Richie Coutain is the Hubble Space Telescope. And, uh, you know, same design. A lot of other scopes are. But one of the things you get with a Richie Cretain is that you, know, you have that secondary mirror out in front. So when you take photographs through it, you get diffraction spikes. And uh, you know, having a secondary out in front reduces the contrast as well. So people definitely want to figure out, okay, how do we avoid the spikes and the reduction in contrast uh, and still have a really sharp image? Well, hey, Herschel thought about this years ago, he tilted his mirror and looked in at the edge. And uh, you, know, you eliminate the secondary, you gather more light. Sounds like a perfect solution, except it throws astigmatism and coma into the, uh, into the mix because you've got a tilted, um, tilted primary. And uh, you know, out toward, you know, on one edge of the field, it's not too bad, but on the other edge of the field, it's terrible. So you know, not a good solution there. Um, but what if we actually just cut a little section out of a larger mirror? Or, you know, it would look like this from the side. Uh, you know, what if we could actually just grind a mirror like that? Well, we've tried it. It's kind of, it works sort of in that over here in the corner, the image is nice and sharp. And then you've got all your coma that you would have on the normal mirror that's now spread out across the entire field of view. So, yeah. Not very good there either, but it was a, a, a valiant effort, right? Um, but maybe, hey, you know, we can make it really, really long like we did with refractors, right? And here we come, here we go. We've got the shoe Spiegler and there's your light path coming in through the front, getting a primary, bouncing onto a flat secondary, um, flat tertiary, and then into the eyepiece. So really long light path. And uh, you notice that the secondary is out of that light path. So, uh, you know, 
it does actually work if you make it long enough. The coma is not too objectionable, but the magnification is really high. So uh, we talk about, okay, how do we shorten it up a little bit uh, and still get the benefit of that? Well, you can warp the secondary and you can even warp the primary uh, to um, essentially in, induce coma that cancels out the coma from being tilted. And so that can be done. That's the YOLO design. And uh, there's the Chief Spiegler, which does uh, the, kind of what the YOLO does without uh, warping the mirrors. It uh, makes its correction with tilted correcting lenses up near the eyepiece. And um, from what I hear, these work really well. I've never actually looked through one, but uh, you know there are quite a few Chief Spieglers out there in the world. And uh, they uh, apparently work pretty well. Here's another one I like, it's the Stevic Paul. Um, drawing the light path on the telescope. So you can see it bouncing around inside there and coming down to yet another mirror, it bounces it back up to the altitude axis. Um, or the, actually, since this is a polar, that's the declina declination axis on a polar mount. Um, and so the eyepiece is on that axis. So you never have to change your position when you're looking in the scope. So uh, I, th I thought this is, cool. And just in the small world uh, department, this is uh, Paul Stevick, or David Stevick rather. Um, he's the father of one of my wife's co-workers. <laughs> so who knew, <laughs> right? The world is very small. Um, so uh, that Naismith design is actually a fairly common design. Um, it puts the eyepiece right at a convenient height. You can just sit in the chair. Um, you can mount the chair on your um, azimuth platform if you want and then swing around with the telescope and uh, you'll always have the eyepiece at the same height uh, or you can introduce a secondary mirror down inside a schmidt casper and then put your camera up there halfway up the, up the side of the tube and uh, so you've got a schmidt casper and naismith which i think i don't know this probably yet doesn't qualify as the weirdest telescope i've seen but it's pretty weird and uh, I've uh, talked to the guy who made that and he said, yeah, it, it takes great photographs. So uh, pretty cool. Um, and that the idea of the Naismith by uh, shining the light out through the rotation axis of the uh, optical tube assembly, um, it's very common in, uh, in uh, professional telescopes where you've got like uh, spectrometers or uh, you know, whatever kind of photometric equipment you've got, you can set it on a bench over here on the side and reflect the light over to the instrument. And as you move the telescope around, um, you know, uh, if you're just rotating around the uh, altitude axis, you don't have to make any corrections at all. If you rotate in azimuth, you just change this coup de flat and rotate it to account for your altitude uh, or your azimuth uh, uh, adjustments. And you can keep shining your light right back onto that same um, equipment on the bench. So there's an awful lot of professional telescopes that have this Coudé uh, focus, which I think is pretty cool. And then you get just plain weird. I think this does qualify as the weirdest telescope I've ever seen. I haven't actually witnessed it in person, but the light path goes like this. Light comes in through that ob oblong hole, bounces back to a mirror there, bounces back to another mirror there, bounces to another mirror there, bounces to another mirror there, and comes out the eyepiece. And yeah, that that takes the cake as far as I'm concerned. I don't think I've ever seen a weirder telescope than that, uh, <laughs> the, uh, the Herrig telescope. So uh, I'm pretty impressed with that. I would love to look through it. I think it would be a delight just to look through that telescope. And it looks like it must be set up for solar observing. I don't know, either that or they just took a picture of it in the daytime. So refractors can get into this crazy stuff too. Uh, you know, you can put a lens in front and then bounce the light around however you like. And now we look at that. There's the Mangan mirror there in this 13-inch uh, Schuchman telescope. And here's an 8-inch. Oh, yeah. Oh, <laughs> okay. Here, there's an 8-inch version of a Schuchman. Um, I can't remember where that is. Um, cellophane, perhaps. I don't, I don't know. But... Uh, that's a real live Schutman telescope with a very, very long focal length, uh, eight, inch, uh, eight inch lens in front too. 
so okay you know it just goes on and on crazy 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 and uh, um you know i could talk about the history and what's been made but let's talk about you know what's being made now so you know, for a moment let's go back to the basics what does the scope really need and this is my star testing rig there's a primary mirror platform with three little cork buttons that i set the mirror on the secondary is on an adjustable board so i can get the focal length right and back and behind this secondary mirror is a focuser. That's pretty much all you need. Uh, this scope is only good for aiming at Polaris, but the stick is just the right length to hold it up at 44 degrees, which is my latitude. So I get Polaris with this scope. And uh, so that's what a Newtonian telescope anyway needs. So with that in mind, okay, David Davis had a 13 inch mirror, which is right here. He calls it fuzzy. That's his affectionate name for this telescope. Um, in fact, this scope is going to be featured in, a, in my column, I think, uh, two or three months from now. Uh, and he just wanted to show what the mirror would do. So he wanted to throw together a telescope very quickly. And he found a sheet of this Pink Panther insulation foam in his garage. And he cut it into strips and stuck, it, stuck the strips down inside a flower uh, planter. And taped it together with blue gaffer's tape. And then uh, he tightened it up by squirting... Um, uh, spray foam in the joints and that really snugged it up tight and he uh, bolted a focuser and a finder on it and there's his 13 inch scope and it took him an afternoon to build and he took that to the Oregon star party and people paid more attention to his scope than any other scope at that star party I think <laughs> it was really cool <laughs> so a uh, friend of mine named Craig Daniels because it's uh, propped up on what he calls the dog leg and so it's the Dogsonian telescope. And it's just four slabs of wood. You don't need a round tube at all. Just four slabs of wood. Down inside, he's got the primary there. He lives out on the coast, so he wants to be able to remove the mirrors easily for storage to keep them from getting uh, corroded by the salt air. So this primary just slips in and out through this door that he's opened here. And you can see what he's got here is a sled focuser. This little uh, Acme threaded wooden dowel pulls the primary up and down. So his, uh, his focuser is down in the bottom of the scope and his eyepiece just goes into a tube at the top. So uh, I think that's pretty unusual for a design, but it's a very functional design, it works really well. Another friend of mine, uh, Chuck Watt, built this by eliminating the middleman, he calls it. Um, and this down here is a typewriter carriage where you would, you know, type, 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 ding, and then you'd shove it over <laughs> and then type, 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 ding. Well, he's got the typewriter carriage, very fine gearing, right? Very smooth. And down here, he's got a little knob that moves it forward and back. So he focuses by moving the primary back and forth. And sure enough, his eyepiece is locked in. There's no adjustment up there at all. And uh, curved secondary to eliminate uh, diffraction spikes. So uh, that, one, that was a, a cool design. I think he gave it to uh, one of his nephews and they're still using it. Mark Yonker, uh, another builder out here in the Northwest, um, decided to think inside the box, <laughs> literally. The, the top box slides down inside the middle box and that slides down inside the bottom box and that nests inside the rocker uh, box or inside the ground board, I guess. Well, no, the rocker box. And the way he gets it down inside tighter is he turns it 90 degrees so that the altitude bearings are sticking out on the side. So the whole thing fits down within this bottom box when he's traveling. And uh, I've looked through this telescope. It's got a 12-inch uh, uh, Steve Swayze mirror in that. It's gorgeous. The view through that is stunning. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I mean, it looks like a pile of boxes. Mel Bartels is always good for a weird-looking telescope. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, he built this 13-inch uh, scope he calls a zip dob um, several years ago. And the way it works here, these struts come off and the primary or the secondary cage folds down. Each of these little round red or little black knobs is a, a hinge and it all folds down together to where everything just kind of rolls up like a little roll up bug on top of the primary. And uh, you can carry it like a suitcase, uh, brilliant design. And uh, he scaled it up to a 25 inch. And look at this, he's looking near the zenith and he's actually crouched down a little bit in a 25 inch telescope. It's like F2.6. Um, 
Oh, and he's done another really cool thing down at the base of the scope here. He's got what he calls the alt alt as mount. And he's got your typical altitude motion with this bearing in here. And then he's got another altitude bearing here. So he can push the scope over sideways about 10 degrees or 15 degrees. And he does have, he has no Dobson's hull. When the scope is pointed straight up, he can move the scope sideways as well as in traditional altitude. And, uh, you know, he can track something right through the zenith without having to rotate the telescope. Um, brilliant, brilliant design. I love that. I wrote about it a few years ago. Um, and I think he is uh, using that. He uh, just scaled up again to a 30 inch design and he's using that same alt alt now there too. So pretty cool. Go in the other direction. If you want to make the smallest telescope you can, uh, Roll Weigenberg, I think, has probably done as, about as good as I can imagine. And I have copied this design myself. I made one myself, which uh, was featured just last month in the Sky and Telescope. Um, I guess actually it's the April issue. Uh, but yeah, there's a big article about my version of this. I wrote about Royals back in 2016, and it took me about five years to work up the courage to try building one myself. But these are great. They pack down to where everything fits inside the case. Um, you know, this is an eight inch telescope he's holding in his hand there. Uh, the trusses, the eyepieces, everything fit inside that box. You can tell this is where the, uh, the this is the ground board. And then this becomes the altitude or the, uh, the rocker box sitting on top of it with a bolt in the middle. And then you just build the scope up from there. Uh, I think that is a brilliant design. That's where I stole it. <laughs> And here's, here's the one I came up with independently years ago. I made a really short focal length telescope and or a very short focal length mirror. And then I was wondering what I could do with it that would actually take advantage of that short focal length. And I got the idea of sticking it down inside a ball and mounting the ball on a, uh, at first it was just gonna be like a, a round, like a toilet seat kind of a mount or set it in a bucket or something, right? And then it occurred to me that I could uh, put a drive axle on, one side, and if that drive axle pointed at Polaris, uh, I could make the scope track. And I could still just move it around however I like, just by grabbing the top and slewing the scope around. When I let go, the scope would be tracking. And then uh, you have to get your balance pretty well, uh, and which is why I've got a lead weight hanging off the back here. If I put a heavy eyepiece in, I take a weight off. Um, but you, once you get the balance right, it tracks pretty well. And uh, I discovered later that I didn't invent it. A guy named Pierre LeMay, beat me to it by 10 years and he had published in Sky and Telescope before I did, but I didn't, I didn't see his article. Uh, so I kind of reinvented the wheel here. But Pierre and I are uh, on good terms and we both try and popularize what he calls the equatorial, um, equatorial ball and I call the trap ball. So there's that. And then here's a binoscope I built. It's a 12 inch binocular telescope. Um, you know, you, you look in here, looking down in to the two eyepieces. So you're looking over your shoulder. The scope is, is shining over your shoulder as, as you're observing, which is great um, at most altitudes until you get down toward the horizon. And then you're crawling underneath the telescope to look in those eyepieces. It is, <laughs> you know, it is not for, uh, for people with joint problems. I'll tell you what. So um, yeah, my, my lifetime on that telescope is kind of limited, I think, by um, my health. But for now, I'm still using it and I love it. And uh, Frank Kapansky, another guy here in uh, Oregon uh, who builds telescopes, he built a weird binocular telescope. He calls it Popeye because he's using two different diameter mirrors. Over on this side is a 12 and a half inch mirror, F6. And on the other side is a 10 inch F7. Um, the same focal length. And uh, so he's built a secondary cage. There, this is sort of a traditional secondary cage for the 10 inch. And then the 12 inch, this wall here is the spider. The, the light path actually extends outside the, uh, the cage there. And there's a secondary mirror tucked right up against the side. And uh, it works beautifully. And one of the weird things about this is that he runs the light path of one right through the other. And so here's a kind of a diagram showing you, you know, if you're uh, looking at it from the, uh, from the top, you know, you've got one primary or yeah, from the side rather, you got one primary set way forward to the other. 
and it's got a bigger secondary because it's casting its light right through the light path of the other telescope into an eyepiece. And you can set the eyepiece distance uh, to be correct for your eyes. Here's looking at it from the front, looking down in, this is that large secondary casting its light right on through the light path of the other telescope. Now, Frank didn't come up with this. The idea has been around since the 30s, but he's the first guy I know of who actually built one, and he's built several now. And uh, they're really, really good scopes. I've looked through them, and they are great. So uh, that's kind of an odd binocular scope. When binocular scopes are kind of odd to begin with. Although I will point out, when Hans Lippershey was trying to get a patent on the telescope back in 1608 or so, his patent was denied because it was only useful for one eye. They told him, you know, build a binoscope, dude, then we'll see about a patent. So <laughs> binoscopes have been around, or at least in concept, for a very long time. Uh, let's see, what's next? Oh, yes. Robert created a binocular refractor using sort of the same principles as Frank's fancy scope. Um, and in fact, this is going to be in another article that I have just uh, turned in. And so that'll be in what, the August issue, I guess. Um, you got your uh, 80 millimeter um, doublet lens here and you got another one in here, but it's set way back and uh, it bounces its light off of a, uh, a secondary and then back up into the eyepiece like that. Whereas this one bounces off a secondary that's a little higher up and into the eyepiece. And uh, the top one is on rails that go sideways, so he can move the whole optical path left and right for your uh, spacing of your eyes, your inner pupillary spacing. So uh, we, you can do that same trick with uh, that Frank was doing with his reflector. You can do this with the refractor. You're not really casting the light paths through one another because by the time they get back to the back of the telescope, they've gotten the, the cone is narrowed down enough to where they clear each other. One of the cool things about this is the secondary doesn't act like an obstruction. So it can be as big as you want. You know, you can use a big old sheet of, of uh, fr front surface glass mirror and it works just fine in the back for a secondary. Okay, moving on to the weirdest <laughs> telescope I've seen in a while. Brent Burton, uh, he emailed me with a, a really beautiful telescope that he had made that I featured in uh, uh, sky and telescope years ago and then just as a lark he said and here's my latest project and I, I told him oh dude I am so writing about that one too because it's made out of buckets this is uh, the top is two two gallon buckets stuck together the bottom was obviously just the ace hardware five gallon bucket these are drink cups from the olive garden uh you know this is the plumbing fitting I don't know why I didn't use a drink cup up there too but the idea is just you know make it as simple and functional and ugly as possible. <laughs> and uh, what's in here optically, it's parts from a oh, uh, star blast, maybe I think something like that. So, you know, he's got good optics in there, um, but it's just a cobbled together scope kind of to demonstrate the bare minimum that it requires to, do, uh, to build a telescope. So, uh, this is this beautiful scope that he made with exotic hardwoods. Uh, so I, I featured that too in one of the columns. Um, and then if you really want a beautiful, beautiful telescope, you, you know, go no further than looking for something made in Norman Fulham. He makes these gorgeous telescopes. They, they look like organic things that just grew out in the forest, you know. Um, I've never had the pleasure of uh, handling one of those myself, but uh, I've seen them. Uh, in photos and, and uh, you know, I've talked to people who've seen them at star parties and they say they are works of art and I, I totally agree. So getting into, uh, we're, we're coming down the home stretch here, uh, getting into the kind of odd uh, con conceptual things. This is a pool of mercury and they spin the telescope to throw the mercury out sideways toward the edge and that creates a parabola. And so what this is, of course, is it's a transit telescope. It can only point upward. Uh, you know, your secondary mirror, or actually, I think just a photo detector up here. I don't think there's a secondary. If so, then it would be balancing its light back down to a, a detector down here. But they just spin it, um, and not very fast. 10 RPM is enough to spin a six meter diameter um, layer of uh, mercury into a reflective surface that uh, focuses up here. So 
I think that qualifies as an unusual design. And of course we have Sophia, the infrared telescope that's mounted in an airplane and they just roll the door up and <laughs> fly along uh, with Sophia poking out the side of the telescope. Um, very short focal length there, uh, but uh, you know they get it up to 40,000 feet or so and the air is just rock steady up there. So they can do some serious observing and you're up above most of the atmosphere's uh, moisture. So the infrared uh, light that they're looking for um, you know, they can actually do some pretty good near-infrared observing with that. So it's a functional telescope that uh, actually works. <laughs> I was, I was kind of shocked when I heard about it, but it's pretty cool. And then, of course, the James Webb that's in the news now. And, uh, you know, despite all the setbacks and all of the uh, worry over whether or not it's going to work, so far as I know, everything is still on track and we're ready to go. You know, another few months, we will start getting images from the James Webb. Uh, so there's an unusual design that's just coming to fruition here. Uh, gosh, what, 10, 15 years in the making. So, uh, you know, hopefully worth the wait. And then we get into radio telescopes. I mean, they don't even look like telescopes. This is just a big antenna. Um, and here's what I think is one of the most beautiful radio telescopes I've ever seen. That's in the Ukraine. And uh, I don't know much about it other than, uh, you know, it's a static radio telescope that, uh, you know, it's not steerable other than electronically. You can choose which antennas you're, you're tuning in, that sort of thing. But uh, it's just beautiful. I love it. And uh, here's the one that discovered the uh, cosmic micro ba microwave background. And uh, it's just a microwave antenna. And the interesting thing is you'll notice that this part here is just a section of a parabolic dish that's bouncing light down into um, a receiver down here on the side, a very, very short focal ratio for a parabolic dish, but that's what that is. Um, here's one of the largest steerable radio telescopes in the world. It's a great big dish up there. And uh, you, know, there's, you can just see the secondary cage peeking over the top. So it's gotta be a pretty short focal ratio on that. And uh, then we get the very large array in New Mexico where these individual dishes can move outward away from one another on railroad tracks. And it functions as an enormous interferometer. I think the largest diameter on that is uh, 26 miles, I think it is, uh, a marathon, <laughs> right? Uh, very large uh, um, effective uh, diameter of, of the uh, receiver. Then we get into weirder stuff. X-rays are really hard to focus. They, they go through things unless you hit it at a very, very shallow angle. So you can drop x-rays in on nested plates and they will glance off. And if you curve the next one a little bit and curve the next one a little bit beyond that, they'll glance off of each one down into a detector. And so you get an x-ray mirror stack. That's what an x-ray mirror stack looks like. Lights coming in on this side and your detectors down on that side. Um, that's an unusual telescope. Uh, we get gamma ray detectors. They're actually just looking for the scattered uh, particles of uh, when gamma rays strike the upper atmosphere, um, you get secondary particles. And that's what this telescope's looking for. I love the segmented uh, primary. I mean, that, that, <laughs> that looks like a nightmare to call me. I don't think I'd want to even try. And wow, this is a telescope. It's a neutrino detector in Japan, uh, underground. Uh, you know, they're basically using the earth as a uh, baffle so that they're only getting neutrinos and they're not getting other particles. Um, and new neutrinos come in from any angles. And these are just photo detectors, thousands and thousands of photo detectors. They fill the tank up with water uh, when it's uh, actually in use. And uh, the photo detectors will detect flashes when neutrinos hit uh, the uh, molecules in the water. Uh, every now and then you'll get a flash and these detectors will tell you where the flash is. You know, it's a, essentially a, a three-dimensional grid and you can tell where the flash is and where it's, where it's proceeding. Um, so we can tell the energy level and the direction of the neutrinos that are coming in and hitting this detector. And then of course we've got gravity wave telescopes, the LIGO, and uh, we've got a couple more coming online in Italy and Germany and Japan detecting gravity waves. And it's like, they're telescopes, you know, it's 
<laughs> they're catching essentially one graviton at a time, right? Uh, it's kind of like the early, early, early CD uh, or um, oh, what are they? Uh, um, charge couple devices. Um, when my brother was an, uh, an astronomy student in the 1970s, they made their own CCDs and they were very proud that they got eight pixels in a row. <laughs> and uh, this is kind of the stage we're at with uh, detecting gravity waves. We are able to detect the very, very um, strong, uh, strong ones that are coming through at the right frequency for our detector. Uh, oddly enough, we wouldn't be able to detect a uh, collision of two supermassive black holes because the frequency would be too low for our detector. Uh, but we've seen quite a few um, collisions of uh, medium-sized black holes and uh, neutron stars. So this is a telescope and we know it's actually uh, working. So this is kind of the state of uh, the weirdness of telescopes. But okay, look, one last slide. What are we going to look at in the future? Well, this seems to be where astronomy is headed. It may not be the only place astronomy is headed, but we're seeing right now telescopes that you don't even look into anymore. Um, the uh, unistellar uh, EV scope has uh, what looks like an eyepiece, but what that is is just a display that lets you look into uh, the uh, and, and look at a, um, a little teeny TV screen, right? Uh, like your phone screen right down here at the bottom. The eyepiece just focuses on the screen and the screen is getting its data from the secondary and it's not a secondary mirror it is a collector up there it's a camera uh, where the secondary would normally be and uh, the Stalina same basic idea without even bothering to give you an eyepiece it just has a collector in the back it's, it's a refractor instead of a reflector and um, got an eyepiece or an, uh, it's got a detector in the back and it sends the data to your phone and, uh, you know, you, some of us are cringing, uh, <laughs> right? I did when I first thought of it. Uh, like, wow, that, this, that's everything I don't like about astronomy, right? Uh, but uh, astrophotography is becoming a much bigger deal. And astrophotographers love these things. And also, they're really good for cutting through light pollution. So if you're observing from a light polluted city, um, these things will track the sky and it will build up an image over time using stacking software. Uh, and so you can actually see the Orion Nebula from New York City. You know, uh, I can't argue with that. Uh, it's one of those things that <laughs> it's a technology that's changing things. Uh, the good news for me is I don't think it's going to change astronomy significantly. It's not going to make my Dobsonian obsolete, uh, but it's a new thing. And um, it's perhaps the most unusual telescope design I have seen yet. And with that, I am done with slides. I will stop sharing my screen. And uh, we got questions or comments or anything, um, have at it. Any questions for Gary? Hey, yes. I have one, Joe. It's, it's more of a okay. comment than a question. I, I, can I go ahead? Yes. Yeah, go for it, Rick. Yeah. Hey, so Jerry, I I, uh, I tested both the Stellina and the EV scope for Sky and Tell. Um, right. Our reviews appeared in in uh, two different issues in 2020. Um, I was I was skept I was of course very skeptical of them as well at the beginning. Um, they perform pretty well. Um, there's some th there's reasons why I like the EV scope better. Um, but one of the things you, you didn't mention, yeah, you can see the Orion Nebula from a bright light polluted city, but you not only see it, but it's in color. Right. Okay. And so what I have found and what I said in my reviews is that what I think these telescopes, well, at first and foremost, these telescopes, I think, are can be particularly good for public outreach because uh, people are so used to seeing color astro images, you know, all the Hubble images and everything else, that when they look in even a pretty good sized amateur telescope, uh, unless they're looking at the moon or, you know, the Orion Nebula or, or M13 or M27 or something, it's, it's pretty hard to see 
the object. I mean, you, we know what we're looking for and, and we know how to use a bird division and we can appreciate uh, that the reason the damn thing is so faint is because it's, you know, 20 million light years away or something. Um, <laughs> but when a kid first looks in a telescope, unless you're looking at the moon or Saturn or something, you know, it's like, I, I can't even see anything in there. So, uh, and I tested this when I had the Stellina and when I had the EV scope is I had neighbors look through my telescopes, my regular telescopes and look through the these uh, enhanced vision or, or uh, vi you know, uh, electronically augmented telescopes. And they were blown away by these new telescopes because, you know, wow, it looks like a Hubble image. So that's <laughs> first and foremost, that's, that's one thing that they're particularly good for. Um, the, and when, um, when the New Hampshire Astronomical Society is able to resume public stargazing events, uh, I'm hoping to bring my EV scope which I, I ultimately bought, uh, bring my EV scope along with um, a similarly sized ordinary telescope and, and allow people to look at the same object uh, with the two different telescopes and, and see what they think. Um, the other thing is that the EV scope, uh, it, one of its claims to fame is that it, uh, it is, uh, it's produced by a company in France called Unis, uh, Unistellar, but uh, but they did it in partnership with the SETI Institute, and the, the telescope is designed uh, to create a network of thousands of citizen scientists. Um, and one of the things I did when I had the EB scope uh, for testing was I uh, did some exoplanet follow-up of test sources uh, from NASA's test satellite. And I was able to detect uh, millimagnitude uh, transits with this four and a quarter inch telescope. Or four and a half inch telescope. Uh, wow, that so, is pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, in, in fact, one of the light curves I submitted, uh, they told me was the was the 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 smallest transit they'd they'd seen anybody detect with one of these things. So yeah, you can do you can do real science with these telescopes. Is the point. yeah. Another thing I think would be really useful. Um, I I kind of get into asteroid occultations, and. Uh, you know, you That's one of the programs that they run. They run asteroid occultations, they run exoplanet uh, transits, um, and they, uh, they've done some variable star things too. Right. Yeah, because yeah. you just set the thing to go and it'll take images all night, as long as you don't mm -hmm. run out of memory on your smartphone. Right. Yeah. So Rick and, Rick and Jerry, could, is, could there be a kit to put on our regular telescopes? to do the same thing that just makes it as pre-packaged as possible, except we use our regular telescopes? I think it's inevitable. Um, we're already partway there with things like Celestron StarSense, where you can retrofit a telescope with a, you know, with an auto guiding uh, plate solving camera. Um, and we already have relatively inexpensive um, imagers that you can plop into an eyepiece holder. So I think it's inevitable that we'll see packages like that. Um, I think so. And, and I think that's good because the Unistellar scope and the uh, Stellina are in the neighborhood of $4,000, which is a lot of money. Uh, although if you were to take a good, good high quality small telescope and outfit it yourself with a similar camera and auto guider and uh, go-to mount and all the rest, you might end up spending that much. But it'll be interesting to see if they can get systems like this down in the you know, $1,000 and under range, which I think is inevitable just looking at the history of commercial telescopes. Uh, everything starts out really expensive and then it ultimately ends up cheap. I think you know, five years from now, we're probably gonna see the, the price at least cut in half, if not better than that. I, I think it's a real endorsement when you say that you actually went ahead and bought the uh, EV scope. You know, I mean, that, that's really the, the uh, endorsement is when you actually lay down some cash on it. <laughs> right, right, right. Of course, now they have an EV scope too, which has a better camera and a better eyepiece. And of course, I wish I had that, but there's no upgrade path, unfortunately, short of selling the old one and buying a new one. Right. That's not the eight inch version, is it? I, I oh, see no, no, no. There, there is, yeah, this is a different thing altogether. I forget the name of it, but there's another, it may be from the same people who do the Stellina. There's a, there's a much, actually there's a 16 inch version. Oh, uh, no. It's $45,000 uh, <laughs> and it, it takes this to the next level. It has, you can order it with uh, UBVRI filters or you can order it with 
you know, the Hubble palette imaging filters, uh, you know, the sulfur two and the nitrogen, this and that. And so, um, but, and it's meant for permanent installations, obviously as a 16 inch telescope uh, that costs, you know, many tens of thousands. But, uh, but I think uh, this, this technology is clearly going to become uh, ubiquitous. Uh, it will not replace, as you say, traditional telescopes, but it will bring certain kinds of astronomy to a lot more people, uh, especially when the price comes down. Um, and so I think, you know, on balance, it's a good thing. When I first saw it, I thought it was horrible, but uh, <laughs> that was just because that's our natural instinct, right? Whenever we see something new and totally different from what we're used to, we think, oh, that's God awful. Um, but eventually it becomes the norm. You know, it's interesting. My own reaction was almost the opposite. When I first heard about it, I thought, oh, this is so cool. And I got a hold of the, uh, the designers and talked with them and I invited them out to the Oregon Star Party. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that was a year I was unable to go. So I wasn't actually able to meet them there. And, uh, you know, but then I started hearing about, you know, the price tag and, and yeah. the, you know, and everything I heard about it was negative for a year or so to the point where I kind of became a naysayer as well. Uh, and then a friend of mine actually bought one and uh, started using it. And he was telling me, no, no, this is, this is the way it's going to be. So, yeah, yeah I, my, my interest level rose or, you know, rose and then fell and then rose again, I think. Mm -hmm. Very good. Any, any other questions for Jerry? Marion? Oh, I see yeah. Mary. I, I, I got uh, one. Keep turn my thing. Whoops. Oh, hold on. I go back on. So, oh, whoops. Am, am I on the air? Another $14 million. All right. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I'm going to. Dave? Great. Okay. Um, Go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, Jerry, you had a picture of a fellow in an observatory. It was a oh. truck he had, and his name is uh, Jim Daly, and he lives in uh, New Ipswich, New Hampshire. Oh, okay. Is that the that was the big uh, eight inch Schupman telescope? Yeah. Oh, okay. Great. So uh, New Hampshire. So you guys know him? <laughs> I know him from the ATMs of Boston. Okay. Well, cool. Yeah, let me address that down. Oh. Yeah, I'd like to look through that too. on different border patrol sectors all over our southern border, different parts, Del Rio I just had a, I had a question for you, Jerry. Uh, I was saying you, you, you showed a lot of telescopes, but I didn't see a Schmidt Newtonian. A Schmidt Newtonian? Oh, you know, I didn't put one in. Uh, <laughs> I, I could have too. I actually had one. I had one. Uh, Someone donated one to our astronomy club a while ago, and it was so, kind of funny because uh, none of us knew what to do with it. <laughs> and, <laughs> and finally, uh, finally, we uh, let's see what, what what became of that. I, I think one of our club members took it to uh, to go ahead and and finish it out. It wasn't a complete telescope. Uh, somebody had started to make it and hadn't finished it out. Huh. But yeah, that was a couple of years ago, and I haven't heard from him since. I need to rattle his cage and see what he did with that. <laughs> yeah, Mead actually made a, a couple uh, versions, an 8-inch and a 10-inch, and I have the 10-inch. Um, it's, it's difficult to collimate, um, but when you get it right, it, uh, it gives you a wide field, bright, wide field of view. Okay, nice. So what the effective focal length then is not, uh, or a focal ratio is, is not like the 10, F10 of a normal Schmidt uh, system? Um, yeah, it, 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 it is an F10. It's um, uh, you, you have a you have a 10 inch uh, meniscus in front of it, and then um, you've it, it. I can't remember the the focal length is around a, a thousand millimeters. Oh wait, no. So that that would be more F5. like a, that's F5. F5. Excuse me, that's right, F5. Yeah, yep. yeah. So that is a pretty fast fast scope for a Schmidt. That's neat. Yeah. So did they just use one of their 10 inch uh, schmidt cassegrain corrector plates on that or is it a special corrector plate for a Newtonian scope? I don't remember what type of corrector plate it was, whether it was a parabolic or you know, a mirror or not, um, but uh, uh, they made them for a while back in the, um, uh, the late 1990s and uh, early, 2000, early 2000s hmm. and then discontinued them. But, uh, uh, 
Yeah, I really enjoyed that. I was curious as to whether or not you've ever experienced one and what your opinion was. Oh, I've never looked through one, but uh, I have. I've held one in my hands. That's <laughs> as close as it's come. <laughs> Good, uh, David. Yes. Um, <clears throat> thank you for a great presentation, Jerry. Oh, um, thank you. Very welcome. Your uh, image that you had about the X-ray uh, detector collecting the X-rays, right? Uh, with, with the shallow angle, you know, multiple mirrors for the shallow angle. Is that the same uh, technology that uh, Chandra X-ray telescope use? I don't know. I honestly it is. don't know. It is absolutely. Is it? Yeah, oh, okay. all the X-ray telescopes use that it's called grazing okay. incidence optics. Yep, they all use it. Okay, great. Thank you. Cool. I, going back for a moment to uh, Schmidt Newtonians, I would assume that with the corrector plate, you don't get the coma problems that one normally does with uh, a standard parabolic mirror. Tom, I'm going to leave that one to you. <laughs> yeah, that's that's that was one of the uh, that was one of the features of that telescope. And then when you used uh, Teleview's, uh, um, uh, I can't Paracor? remember what it's called now. Paracor. Uh, Paracor. Uh, it even got better. So yeah. yeah that was so my you... understanding is the the Schmidt partially corrects for the coma. Right. Mm -hmm. for, okay. For that design. So right. I assume you have to put a pretty good dew shield out in front of that, or you're going to do up just like a normal Schmidt Cassegrain, right? Oh yeah, you get a bathtub. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yeah, I, I live in the Pacific Northwest, and I have a Schmidt Cassegrain, and uh, I tell you what, that's my summer telescope because in the winter time it's just hopeless. I cannot keep it from doing up. <laughs> oh really? Just use a heater and a in a big. Uh, uh, um, uh, uh, do shield on it, and usually you know you can get away with it. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I, I my heater is basically chemical uh, hand warmers that I stuff down inside oh, the do oh, shield, yeah. so <laughs> they're not very effective. <laughs> Twelve volt hair dryers are invaluable around here. You uh, know, true. that's what I'm using too. And the thing is, you know, that Schmidt Cassegrain after two or three. Uh, Blast with the hair dryer, the dew winds up inside on the on the inside of the corrector oh, plate. Yeah. yeah, and that, then you got to warm it up enough to melt it off the inside. And I'm not sure I want to do that. <laughs> any any other questions for Jerry? Uh, Marion? Yeah, I just I, I wasn't here at the beginning of the meeting, uh, but I was wondering how do you pronounce your last name? Oh, I just say Oltian. Oltian. Yeah. Little family history. I'm, I'm Romanian, and there's an Olt River in Romania, and so I think my family must come from the Olt River Valley. So we're Oltians. That's all I can figure. <laughs> I read your your column first. That's about the first thing I, I look at when I get my Stein telescopes. Oh, very good. Thank so, you. And, for and before that, that um, uh, Gary Ceranic, and before that, the Cleanings. <laughs> Well, you know, that's, that's probably why I wound up with Gary's job, because I would always read his uh, columns first when I got the magazine, and then I started submitting my own projects uh, to him, and he and I got to know each other pretty well. And, uh, you know, yeah, I was always reading the, uh, uh, the what did he call it, telescope workshop column uh, for years before I wound up kind of taking that over. <laughs> okay, thanks. All right. Jerry, thank you very much. This has been wonderful. Glad to have you. And um, um, you're well, welcome for to stay, me. but you don't have to stay. We're, we're just going to go on with our business meeting. So everybody, um, well, big, thank you very much <laughs> for, for Jerry. Thank you very yeah. much. You're welcome. You're welcome. Thanks for having me. I enjoy talking about telescopes. <laughs> so I think I will leave you to, to your business meeting. And, uh, you know, I wish clear skies to you all. And uh, we hope to see you around. Okay. Thanks, Jerry. Thanks Thank very you. much. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, Jerry. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs>